Matthew 26, verse 30 through 35, beginning in verse 30. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives, and then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to manifest the humility that we need and the brokenness and meekness that we need. We do not want to be um, triumphalistic in our own abilities. We don't want to be confident in ourselves, but we want our confidence to be in Christ. And so forgive, forgive us for the times when we exude pride, which is a lack of confidence in Christ. I pray, Father, for all here that we would all keep our eyes focused on our Lord Jesus. And for those who are in sin today, you would call them out of it and bring them into your kingdom of light. And that mercy would be made known to them. That all of us would be more broken and humble for having come and listened to your word. In Christ's name, amen. So this is the Passion Week of Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is... On, have been, has been on a journey since we, come to the, since we came to the Gospel of Matthew to be crucified. And so his whole, really, gospel is pointing to the cross, and he's moving towards the cross. And so here we are in this Passion Week, the last week before, or the week, really, of the crucifixion. And by this point in the week, Judas has already made the deal with the religious leaders. He's going to betray Jesus. Um, he's going to be the informant. And with the betrayal, he receives 30 pieces of silver. He's already received the money. They've celebrated the Passover, which is the Thursday, today's passage. They're just wrapping up the Passover. And we have in this passage today the institution, or sorry, last week we had the institution of the Lord's Supper. The end of the Passover in verse 30 we see in verse 30, and it says, when they had sung a hymn, they end the Passover with the singing of a hymn. And then it says, they went up to the Mount of Olives. They went out to the Mount of Olives. So they go up to the Mount of Olives. Hymns were likely part of the Passover liturgy, and so they ended their time of Passover with the singing of a psalm, likely, Psalm 115 to Psalm 118. And then they head up to the Mount of Olives. Very courageous, I think, of our Lord. He embodies true courage and bravery at this point as he's knowing that his crucifixion is within hours, his trials within hours. He's about to be crucified in the most painful of deaths and in that crucifixion or leading up to that crucifixion and being imminent, what does he do? He sings a hymn. I think that's honorable. I think that's brave. I think it's courageous and he's, he's showing us how it's done. He marches to his death singing the hymns of God. The Mount of Olives, where they go now, they're leaving Jerusalem, they're going up to the Mount of Olives, is east of the city. We've talked about the Mount of Olives before. And they were on the western slope in Gethsemane, overlooking the city. And so it is the city proper, Jerusalem proper, where they find themselves. And they're overlooking Jerusalem by night. They're on the western slope of the Mount of Olives, Gethsemane overlooking Jerusalem by night, heading to Gethsemane at least. In this setting on the evening before the crucifixion, the crucifixion, the trial and the crucifixion is to be within hours. It's a mock trial as we'll find out in a few weeks. Um, a back and forth erupts between the disciples and Jesus. And so there's actually a, an argument that breaks out. And the argument is not amongst the disciples. The argument is between Jesus and the disciples. So Jesus makes a point, and the disciples figure that it's a really good time to start arguing with him and to try and convince the Savior that he's wrong, and um, they go back and forth. So this, this really shows you the heart of man 
in that they've just had this beautiful Lord's Supper celebration. They've, they've eaten the, the body of Christ. They've drunk the blood of Christ. Um, as the text says, symbolically speaking, but the text says they, they ate and they drank. They received the forgiveness of sins. They're reminded of their forgiveness through this eating and drinking. They've had this intimate time of fellowship with our Savior. And then through this time of fellowship, they leave it and they're on their way to um, a little bit more teaching, some time of prayer, and they have an argument. Uh, this is true human nature that breaks out. Some of you might have been on your way to church this morning and you had an argument with your wife or with your kids. Well, just know that you're in good company with the disciples. Okay? Uh, that it, it happens to the best of us because the best of us are sinners. Jesus wasn't the problem. They were the problem. And they were the problem because they were pr full of pride and full of sin. And if you had an argument this morning, at least one person in your family is full of pride and sin. Probably all of you are. And uh, so it would be a good time to go to the cross. And this is what the Lord is going to drive them to eventually is the cross. So on this, in this setting, on, to, on the way to this famous place called Gethsemane on the western slope of the Mount of Olives, there's a back and forth, and it begins with a prophecy of Jesus Christ. And then Peter tries to contradict Jesus, and then it, Jesus comes back at Peter, and then Peter then again thinks that he knows better than Jesus and attempts to uh, contradict him again. Now, I hope you understand that the Christian life is a series of highs and lows, especially the Christian life of um, more immature believers. So those who are just getting to know the Lord and those who are just learning to walk with the Lord, you have more sporadic peaks and valleys, whereas in, um, as you mature, things mellow out a little bit, but at the same time, you still do experience those highs and lows. This is a spiritual low point. It's amazing to me that in one chapter, how, many, uh, how, how varied their Christian experience is. High, low, high, low, um, very quickly. And I hope, well, I suspect that a bunch of you can relate to this, especially if you're new Christians. How quickly you go from a spiritual high to a spiritual low, and then you have to be brought back to repentance and come to the Lord again. There was a spiritual low point in verses 6 through 13. There was the anointing at Bethany. Jesus is anointed at Bethany with a very expensive ointment, um, led by Judas this time. The disciples uh, verbally attack the woman that anoints Jesus, and Jesus points that she's simply proclaiming his worthiness. And he settles the thing, thing down. Well, that's a spiritual low. Uh, there's a spiritual high in verse 22. We looked at last um, time. Or sorry, we looked at it a few weeks ago in verse 22. And it says, and they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? So they, they weren't willing to point the finger at everyone else. When Jesus had instructed them and Jesus had told them, that one of them would betray them. They're not looking around the room in suspicion. They're simply looking into their own hearts. And this is a wonderful point of instruction for us. We see the humility and the meekness in the hearts of the disciples at that point. So that was a spiritual high. And then here we are at a spiritual low again in the disciples as they break out into um, an argument. I think that it's very possible that today's text was actually a fleshly attempt at a spiritual high that turned into a spiritual low because they were trying to accomplish the work of God in the flesh. And this is possible as you, as you learn to walk as a Christian and you face mammoth tasks that God gives you, you come to the task and the immature Christian will come to the task and, and he'll just say, I got this in his, in his flesh. And so it's, and it's an attempt at a spiritual victory that is done in the flesh. And I, my experience as a Christian is that when we come to tasks in the flesh thinking, I've got this, I've got it in me to fight this, 
that's when we often fall flat on our faces. And I've had to learn some very painful lessons this way, and you, if you haven't, you, you will. This God is gracious to you. When we come to difficult tasks, we, come, we should come to it with the sweetness of a broken heart, saying, oh, but the grace of God. I need the strength of our Lord Jesus. I need Him, and if it's up to my own strength, I will fail. And I, and I really believe that if it, if it weren't for the grace of God, every single one of us would have fallen away from Christ within seconds of our um, initial commitment to Him. Okay? We, we need the sustaining grace and the sustaining power of God. And if you're walking before God as if you are self-confident, self-confident in your spiritual standing, you're reflecting what the disciples are displaying right here, and it's going to lead you to problems. And so this, what this is today is it is a fleshly attempt at a spiritual high. It's, it's an attempt to honor the Lord with the arm of the flesh as opposed to come to God with a broken heart knowing your own need aware of your propensity to sin and rebellion and cowardice and weakness, dependent upon Christ. That's the wrong way to go about things, is the way the disciples are doing it here. The right way is to be broken. The wrong way is to say, oh, I've reached the point where I can do this. And I think there's too many Christians around that are thinking that they can honor the Lord simply because they're strong people. And you don't understand yourself. And in fact, if you think that you can honor the Lord because you're a strong person, you have a very different view of yourself than the Lord has of you. And if you want to get down to the root of Peter's problem right here, you want to really drill down to Peter's issues right here, Peter's issues is that he has a higher view of himself than Jesus has of him. And he wants to fight Jesus over it. And so... It's upon us as Christians, and if you haven't learned this, you will, and it's going to be painful um, if you don't listen. If you haven't learned this, you're going to have to. And, and that is, it is, it's the brokenhearted that honor the Lord. It's the meek that inherit the earth. But when I say meekness, I don't mean cowards. But the true boldness and the true courage springs up out of a low view of your own self and a dependence upon Jesus Christ. That's where it comes from. And so we have in this text, I'm going to give you four movements in the text, four points. We have Jesus' prophecy, then Peter's pride, then Jesus' prophecy, then Peter's pride. You have Jesus' prophecy, Peter's pride, Jesus' prophecy, Peter's pride. One, two, three, four. Two instances of Christ prophesying, each instance of Christ prophesying followed by an instance of Peter displaying pride. Jesus' prophecy, Peter's pride, Jesus' prophecy, Peter's pride. In this, we find an example of what not to be. Instead of boasting in our perceived spiritual power and maturity, we should perceive our weakness and depend upon Christ, okay? And here Peter shows that he thinks he's stronger than Jesus says he is. I mean, repeat this. This is really the thrust of my sermon. And if you want to understand my sermon, you got to understand this. In this today, we find an example of what not to be. Instead of boasting in our perceived spiritual power and maturity, we should perceive our weakness and dependency on Christ. And here Peter displays that he has yet to learn that lesson. He shows that he thinks he's stronger than Jesus says he is. And he shows a self-dependence, not a dependence upon Christ. And you don't want to be like that. You don't want to be dependent upon yourself. You want to be dependent 
upon Christ. So let's look at number one, Jesus' prophecy. Jesus' prophecy. So they've, they've left the, the table fellowship at the Lord's Supper. They sung a hymn. They've headed out to the Mount of Olives, and it looks like they're on their way to the Mount of Olives. Okay? Um, maybe they're already, but I think they're on their way. And Jesus prophesies something, and he prophesies that their defection is very near. This is to all of the 11 that are left. Judas has left them by this point, as the other Gospels indicate. But Jesus issues a prophecy, and the prophecy is that their defection is very near. Verse 31, then Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. So it's evening time, and before the, the day cracks, the next day breaks, the sun cracks over the eastern sky, all of them are going to defect. This is... This is going to be the complete defection of the church. Don't miss how monumentous this is in the history of the church. The crucifixion of Jesus Christ marks a season, albeit a very brief one, but a season where the entire church has defected, has gone dark. It's a very dark season. Between the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ, every last Christian on the face of the earth is defected. At least it appears that way from this text. At least it appears that way. Maybe there's some women at the cross who, who maintain their faith throughout, perhaps, but certainly the leadership of the church is defected. The remaining leaders have. So this is dark. And I think this would have changed the mood of the conversation. So Jesus has the habit of dropping these little bombs here and there. And, you know, here we are merrily on our way to Gethsemane singing hymns into the night after this beautiful time of the Lord's Supper and the spiritual high point where the believers are exercising a level of introspection into their hearts and then coming to Christ to feast upon him as he says and Jesus has the habit of dropping these little bombs and he drops this truth bomb you're all going to defect every last one of you and it gets I, I suspect if you were there it would have become very quiet Jesus says then Jesus said to them you will all fall away because of me the Greek word for fall away is the Greek word from which we get our English word scandalized. They're all going to be, in one sense, scandalized by Jesus. They're going to be ashamed of Jesus. They find that Jesus' actions and the controversy that he has provoked amongst the godless to be too scandalous to stay with him. They can't bear it anymore. And, and look at this, the reason for the defection. Jesus names it. If you just slow down a little bit, you see in verse 31, that Jesus said to them, you will all fall away, you'll all be scandalized, you'll all be ashamed, whatever it is. Why? Because of me. Think of that. It's because of Jesus. That's a very strong word that he's giving them. They're all going to be so embarrassed of their master that they're going to run. And they're going to go into hiding. The scandal will be so much, the intensity of the moment, the spiritual intensity, the, the demons of hell will be so unleashed at this point in history, the, the darkness will be so prevailing that it's if every last little piece of light will just scatter into a hole. It's a terrible thought, really, if you can reach the point in church history where every last Christian leader, even the ones who are born again, run into a hole in fear and deny their master. What a terrible thing. He prophesies, Jesus does, the defection of all the remaining 11. In the, and, and it's not like this is a long ways away. In the next few hours, because it's nightfall by now, you will all fall away because of me this night. This night. And he grounds it in a prophecy 
of Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. And so this is what he quotes in verse 31. At the end of it, he says, For it is written, so there you know there's an Old Testament reference. And this is what's written in the Old Testament, the end of verse 31. I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Well, he's quoting in this prophecy uh, an Old Testament passage, Zechariah 13, verse 7. And the shepherd in Zechariah 13, verse 7, that's being spoken of is a shepherd that's near to God, but it's a shepherd that's martyred and his sheep all scattered. And to scatter in, in this context, the word that you get and the impression that you get is to run to and fro, okay? I remember when I was much younger, I was with my brother, we're walking down the street and we got our hands on some firecrackers and we let them off in my neighbor's garden. My neighbor, who was a marathon runner, chased us down the street and we scattered in different directions. Okay? Do you get the picture? My brother had the sense to go the opposite way that I was going because he knew that if I went one way and he went the other way, um, the neighbor was less apt to find us both. And so this is what they do. They all go in different directions. They don't want to be found out. They don't want to be found out together. They run and they hide. They scatter because they're afraid of who's coming after them. But this is a beautiful prophecy because it's not just about the darkness falling and the scattering. Look at what it says. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But, again it goes on, Jesus goes on at least. He says, but after I am raised, I will go before you to Galilee. This is beautiful. Zechariah speaks of a judgment that is to come. Zechariah speaks of the faithful shepherd being killed. Zechariah speaks of the disciples running. And in fact, if you go into Zechariah 14, he goes on to speak of the judgment beginning in the Mount of Olives where Jesus is going right now, which leads to a purification of the church. And so Zechariah is quoted often in these last few chapters of Matthew because Christ is preparing a scattering of the disciples that is going to lead to a purification of the church. The darkness that will befall them will lead to their own purification and the purification of the true church. So Christ will die, the flock will scatter, and the prophecy is that this will all happen within the next few hours, but it's not just the prophecy of the scattering. Verse 32 tells us that the prophecy also entails that they will show their weakness in scattering, yes, but the one with the, strong, the truly strong arm, the one who is strong enough even without them, will come back and regather them. It's a beautiful picture of Christ. See this? This is what they didn't get, and this is why they're so confident. Because they need Jesus to strengthen them. They run, they scatter, and so what does God do? He raises Christ from the dead to regather his church. What a glorious picture of our Lord coming back from the dead to regather his people. And do you see who gets all of the glory in this? This exalts the power and majesty of Jesus Christ. The prophecy is, is that they will show their weakness, but he will show their strength. And the mention of Galilee, by the way, verse 32, but after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee, brings back happier memories of a better time. Because this is where Jesus found the most success of, in his ministry. This is where he, his ministry was best received as he walked across the region of Galilee and he preached the gospel and people were healed and he gathered crowds of thousands and, and, he, and he fed them fish and he fed them bread and he'd have to stand out in a boat and the crowds would flock and they would come and hear him and they'd witness his miracles as he went from town to town and all of these thousands of people, the crowds, the crowds, the crowds would follow him and now all of a sudden the crowds, the crowds, the crowds have boiled down to 12, nope, boiled down to 11 because one's a traitor, nope, boiled down to zero. Darkness is coming upon the church 
and the mention of Galilee and the mention of the Savior coming again to regather his people brings back these brighter and these happier memories of ministry, is opposed to the darkness now that, that they're now under, and the pressure of death that's imminent in the nails that are about to be driven into our Savior's hands and the disciples that are about to run away in fear. This is a prophecy. And it's a prophecy of the weakness of the disciples and the power of Christ. And it's amazing to me as you live, or as you read through the Bible, I don't know how many times I read it through, as, as you read through the Bible, history often repeats itself, but it never repeats itself the same way. It always repeats itself, but it never repeats itself the same way. God works the same way in different ways. And, and, and this is the way history works with the church, too. And I feel like we, in one way, we've lived through this. This has been a, a story that we've seen with our own eyes on a smaller scale, a much smaller scale, but, but the overwhelming majority of us in March 2020 willingly scattered. And it took the power of God, which included a very painful purification process to regather us, especially going into the winter of 2021 where God really purified his church and regathered an even more powerful church. And I think that the Lord might be up to something very, very significant in our day because we see these patterns repeating themselves, where the ent almost the entire church goes dark, and then by the power of God, He unites the church to regather with more power than she's seen in a very long time. And this is what Jesus is doing here. This is often how purification works. And this is often how persecution works. The first sight of persecution initially spooks the people of God, but then he brings them back by miraculous power, even stronger and more united and more confident in Christ and less confident in themselves than they ever been. And it purifies the church. And this is what the prophecy of Christ is. You guys remember those times in Galilee, walking through the countryside, through the hills, gathering those thousands of people? Well, that was just little old Galilee. You ain't seen nothing yet. You wait to see all the people that are going to come in the kingdom and the churches that are going to be built and the souls that are going to be saved and the lands and the peoples that are going to be turned around. That's nothing. So, 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 the, so the prophecy of Christ here is one sense it's terrifying because darkness is going to come upon the whole church. Even the leaders are going to run into hiding. But then it's glorious because then the Lord is going to raise with, rise with power and with his strong arm, he's going to meet them back in Galilee and he's going to reunite them and then his kingdom is going to burst forth. These are the ways of our king. The scattering, the fleeing, and then the power of God to bring his people back together. Well, that's Jesus' prophecy, and Jesus' prophecy. Now, Peter doesn't hear, at least he doesn't indicate that he hears about the power of Christ. He only hears about an attack on his own pride, his own weakness. And so we have Peter's pride that comes out next as he hears this. And this might reflect some of you right now. You, you might be saying, well, I'm strong enough to honor the Lord. I'd never do what Jesus said those disciples were going to do. Well, you're setting yourself up for failure if that's you. You don't want to be that way. Trust me, I've learned. And I imagine I have more lessons to learn in this regard. But this is Peter's pride. This is a low point for Peter because he reveals his spiritual pride in verse 33. Peter answered him, verse 33, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. You see that? You see, notice, notice how Peter is setting himself apart from the other disciples. Almost see him pointing to the other men. Look at these guys, Jesus. They're all going to fall away, but not me. And they're there, so they hear him. He's creating a sense of division amongst the disciples. And then his, his disdain and his sense, his disdain for them and his sense of superiority over them and his his 
lack of confidence in them, but his great confidence in himself just spills over. I will never fall away emphatically, he says. I will never fall away. He is essentially telling Jesus, not only is he telling Jesus that he's greater than the other disciples, but he's telling Jesus that he is stronger than Jesus says he is. And in one sense, he's calling Jesus a liar. You kidding me, Jesus? I'll never do that. John Gill said, what he failed in was trusting to his own strength, being self-confident, and in entertaining a greater opinion of himself and his steady attachment to Christ than of the rest of the disciples. And this is deadly stuff. It's very dangerous to get into this mindset. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18, helpfully tells us, Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And I, and I wonder, I said it before, I, I really wonder if this is a fleshly reaction to a previous failure. Because he failed in chapter 26, verse 6 to 13, when they started to attack that woman who um, anointed Jesus with the alabaster jar of oil, and he failed there. And I wonder if, I'm wondering if he's rebounding here with an, a fleshly attempt at a spiritual victory, which always fails. If you're going to be victorious spiritually, you've got to find the victory in the spiritual way, not with the arm of the flesh. And sometimes... You can fail and then react to that by relying on the flesh even more. And what you don't realize, it was the flesh that brought you to the point of failure. When I say the flesh, what I'm re saying is you're relying on your own strength as opposed to the strength of God. But there's no brokenness here in what Peter says. He's, he's showing his pride. And what you need to do is be completely depleted of self-confidence and throw yourself on Christ. These, those who are most confident on their own will spiritually fail, that's a certainty. And those least confident in themselves will be most confident, confident in Christ. So those most confident in Christ are least confident in themselves, those least confident in themselves are most confident in, them Christ, confident in Christ, but those most confident in themselves are least confident in Christ. So the Christian walk is not about your self-confidence spiritually. It's about your brokenness before God and relying, relying on the power of Christ. And Peter shows his self-confidence and lack of confidence in Christ in that he doesn't even believe Jesus here. Could you imagine that? You come face to face with God in the flesh. He tells you something and you refuse to believe it. Now that's pride. But let, let's, before I move on to the next prophecy of Christ, let's Let's drill down in the pride for a minute. Do you have a sense? I want to ask you some questions here because I want you to evaluate yourself. Do you have an air of superiority over your brothers and sisters in your abilities? That's dangerous stuff. How about this? Do you think higher of yourself than Jesus does? The, what the Bible says about your nature is awful. It's deplorable. What the word of Christ says about us and our nature and our brokenness and our weakness is absolutely terrible. But what it says about Christ is glorious. And so do you think higher of yourself than the Bible says you should? Because that's trouble. That's pride. And what every one of us needs here today, every one of us needs is brokenness before God, the meekness before Him, and not a sense of pride in our own abilities to get us through things. Okay? We need the Lord. We need the Lord to help us. We need the Lord to bless our efforts. We need the Lord to teach us. And I can apply this to so many different areas of life. You know, if, you're, if you have a marriage issues in your marriage, do you know what you need more than anything is you need Christ. You say, yeah, yeah, I know, Pastor, but, 
but this is what you need to do. This is always, if somebody comes to me with marriage problems, this is always the first thing I tell them to do, and I ask them if they're doing it, is are you praying together that God will help you and give you wisdom? And if they're not, then I say, I don't want to meet with you for a few weeks, and then come back to me and pray together for a few weeks every night that the Lord will help you and give you wisdom, and then we'll meet. But we can't accomplish anything without Christ because often, sometimes when people want help is, is what they want is they want six steps in their own ability to, to fix things up. And it's the same thing with parenting. I've got lots of advice for you on parenting. I've been doing it for 18, over 18 years now. But at the end of the day, what I have learned to be the most profitable thing in parenting is to beg God, with my wife, that he will give us wisdom and come to him with a sense of emptiness. That I, and, then, and, and then one of the things I found is quite often there's just little tidbits that pop up here and there that I'm not even looking for, but I'm asking him to help. And so the, if you need help with your marriage, if you need help with your children, if you need help with your, your Christian walk, it's, it comes by this begging God to help you. And Peter's not manifesting that in here. He thinks he's got it licked. He thinks he's got it done. He thinks he's got it wrapped up in a bow and it's just going to be great. He doesn't understand. He's got a lot to learn yet. And we all do. Well, that's Peter's pride. We go from, Peter, we go from Jesus' prophecy to Peter's pride right back to Jesus' prophecy again. Jesus pushes back. He's not going to back down here. Jesus prophesied, and Peter showed his pride in here. Jesus prophesies again, calling out Peter specifically, verse 34. He's specific to Peter. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Truly. See the word there, truly? Jesus said to him, truly. The Greek word is amen. Okay, amen. And Jesus, what he's doing when he says amen or amen, truly, Jesus, verily, he's saying in some translations, is being emphatic, and he's digging in, and he's not going to give Peter an inch. He's not going to give him a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch, a sixteenth of an inch. He's not backing down. Yes, Peter, that's how weak you are. And in fact, Peter, it's worse than I initially said. He's being emphatic. And Jesus even goes to the point of saying, this will happen before the rooster crows. Verse 34, before the rooster crows. It says, and then he says again, this very night. And this means the denial will be within hours. This marked the crowing of the rooster in this context likely marked the beginning of the third Roman watch, which was between the hours of 12 and 3 a.m. So it's not even going to be by the time the night's over. I mean, you're, we're talking about midnight now. We're not talking about daybreak. We're not talking about dawn. We're not talking about minutes before dawn. We're talking about between the hours of 12 and 3, at some point in there, Peter's going to deny Jesus. Within, you could count the minutes in which this is going to happen. And this is how quick things can change in your walk with God. You hope you realize you're within 10 seconds of wrecking everything. Always. 10 seconds. One quick decision and it's over. Jesus is saying, within hours, minutes of the Lord's Supper, of these great spiritual high points with Jesus Christ, Peter's going to fall in a, in a way that is so embarrassing. So embarrassing as we'll see. And Jesus is specific in how bad Peter's fall will be. It's not just going to be a fall, but Jesus is specific. He says to him, truly I tell you, verse 34, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me not once, not twice, but three times, thrice. So the, so the denial could literally start within the next hour. And then it's going to be one denial, then two denial, and then three denial. And Jesus had taught them to, this is the crazy thing. This is the crazy thing, as Jesus is speaking with Peter here. 
Jesus had taught them to deny themselves for Christ, but here he's telling Peter that Peter is going to deny Christ for himself, for his own self-preservation. And he's not going to do it once. He's not going to do it twice. He's going to do it three times. He's going to deny Peter, or he's going to deny Jesus for himself as opposed to deny himself for Jesus. And therefore, Jesus issues a prophecy. Peter displays his pride. Jesus digs in and locks down and says, no, Peter, this is the way it is. And he gets even more specific with how bad Peter's betrayal is going to be. And you've got prophecy, pride, prophecy. And then finally, the fourth point, the final act in this scene, in this little story, and that's Peter's pride again. He doesn't listen. How many of you get in that place with God? You know God's telling you to do something? Say no. And then God tells you to do it again? No. Right? And then if you, if you get to that point, it's going to get ugly if you're truly converted. If God's telling you to do something and you don't listen, and then he tells you to do it again and you don't listen, by that point, it's probably going to get ugly. And you're going to fall flat on your face, and then he's going to have to be the one that picks up the pieces. And this is where Peter goes. Jesus tells him once, no. Jesus tells him twice, and here we go, no. Peter's pride. Even as Jesus doubled down in his prophecy, Peter doubled down in his pride. Verse 35. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. See, see how Jesus makes this statement? Peter ups it. Jesus ups it again, and now Peter even ups it further. No way, Lord. Even if I must die, this is really upping the ante. And as much as Peter is relying on his own strength to do what's right, there's still a part of him that's wanting to do what's right. He's really wanting to prove his love for Jesus, but again, it's coming from the wrong place. How many, listen, how many people have I seen in ministry or I've seen in leadership in the church over the years who really want to do what's right for the Lord and really want to help the Lord and in in a, in a do what's right and, and honor the Lord in a minute, but I can see that in their hearts they're not operating in the spiritual, they're operating in the carnal, and, I've, and I'll, I'll be frank with you. There's been people in this church who are not with this church anymore who I've seen do this, and I said, if you don't settle down, you're going to wear yourself out and you're going to be gone, and then sure, no, 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 sure enough, within six months they're gone. You need to settle down. You can't do it on your own. There has to be a brokenness, a reliance on God, a reliance on the Spirit of God. And it happens in ministry all the time. And then eventually the Lord's got to pick up the pieces when it's an absolute disaster. And how do I know? Because I've experienced it. You can't do the spiritual in the flesh. It has to be in the spirit, and that only comes by meekness and brokenness. How many have tried to honor the Lord without a limp? And they think they can run with horses, but they can't even run with men. How many? And this is what Peter's doing, even if I must die. It's a part of him that really wants to do what's right, but you've got to admire that, but he's going to do it the wrong way. And, and there's a double negative. I've talked to you about the double negatives in Greek before. That's simply, in, double negative in English means it's a positive, but double negative in Greek means it's an emphatic. And so there's a double negative in this. I will not deny you. What G Peter is saying is, I will not, 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 not deny you. Not deny you. You won't. It's not going to happen. Peter refuses to admit that his denial will come. He's adamant, and he is convinced in his mind that sin and cowardice is something that's beyond him. He is too spiritually mature to be a coward, and he's too spiritually mature to be weak, and he's too spiritually mature to sin. I've met people like this. They think they've, they've reached a place in their Christian life where they're not going to sin anymore. Can you believe people think that way? That's not a mark of Christian maturity. That might even be a mark of apostasy. That's so infantile in the mind of the Christian. So infantile. There's a double negative here, and he is convinced in his mind that sin is beyond him. 
And, and look at what happens. All the other disciples chirp in. They chime in. Verse 35, Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. Oh, man. Wow. All the disciples said the same. Now, now look at this. See, see that little word there, and all? Now just put your finger on that and then, and then, and then go back up to verse 31 and, and look at what it's Jesus said. Then Jesus said to them, you will all. The pride was infectious. It was contagious. You will all and all. They all became prideful at this time. And sometimes the whole church is so consumed with reliance upon the flesh and reliance upon their own abilities that the whole church falls on their face. And this was the disciples. Peter is often the leader, and he leads them in a bad direction here, and he has a spiritual self-confidence which shows a lack of brokenness before Christ, and it's a lack of meekness, and this is going to lead to absolute failure. It's going to be so embarrassing. He's going to deny Christ three times, and he's going to be full of shame. But you know what the glorious thing about Peter is? Is that the Spirit's not done with him. And Jesus Christ himself will restore him. The Lord will restore him. And the Lord does eventually. But 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. And Peter didn't get that. Have you ever looked at someone's sin and how they've wrecked their life and thought, I could never do that? Take heed lest ye fall. If anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. We need a meekness before Christ. They demonstrated that in verse 22, but the, the, as soon as they demonstrated it, they failed again. And see how quickly we can move from meekness to pride within minutes? See how quickly we can move from obedience to failure and sin within minutes? And these men had spent three years walking with Jesus and witnessing his miracles, and they still did it. You look at Peter and you say, I could never do that. Take heed lest ye fall. Take heed. See how easily pride can look spiritual, by the way. See how easily pride can look spiritual? What is, I mean, there's nothing greater than honoring the Lord unto death. And Peter is saying, I will honor you unto death. Even if I must die, I will die. There's nothing greater than dying for Christ. There's no more honorable way to go, I think. So you see how, how spiritual pride can masquerade as. Hypocrisy can come out and even look spiritual. But he failed him. Failed him. And there's a big danger for us in this as a church. A big danger. Because we have past victories. And there's been times in the past where we have honored the Lord where it has not been popular to honor the Lord. And so there's a big danger in this for us. And that big danger is that our past victories don't guarantee future victories. And our past victories don't mean we won't fail in the future. We cannot have a spiritual pride as a church. Don't you think that just because we go to Trinity Bible Chapel, we're always going to honor the Lord? Don't you dare think that. Because the minute we start thinking that, we're in big trouble. Don't you think that just because Trinity Bible Chapel has taken stands over the years, not just the lockdowns, but that was one of them, don't you think that just because we've done that, that, that we're always going to do that? The only way that we're going to honor the Lord is if the Lord gives us the grace to honor the Lord. And the Lord gives grace to the humble and to the broken. And so if there's any sense in you and there's any sense in us that, 
that we're going to exalt ourselves above other Christians or other people simply because of things that we have done for Jesus, we need to remember that anything we've done for Jesus has been an act of Jesus' grace in our hearts. And any future exploits that we have a church as a church for the kingdom of God will be exploits that come to the broken hearted. And if that's not us, it doesn't matter how many good things we're, that we've done, we'll fall flat on our face quickly. And so we need to see ourselves as weak. We need to see ourselves as prone to sin. We need to see ourselves as people who, without the grace of God, would be abject failures. And we need the grace of the one whose blood was shed for us. We, we just need that grace to be humble enough to receive more grace. Everything we do is dependent upon God. Like you can't even, you might be hearing this and say, oh, I'm going to get humble. You see how quickly that goes? I'm going to, I promise I'll be humble tomorrow. Look, that's, that's not how it works. It's this disposition of brokenness that God blesses. And this exaltation of the power of Christ. We need him every moment, every second, every day. This is a hard lesson to learn as a disciple of Jesus Christ. But the only way forward is the way of the brokenhearted, the shattered pride, and the limp. And oh, may God give us mercy that we might be the brokenhearted that we might have the shattered pride and that we might always walk as a limp, with a limp. But if we do, it will only be because Christ gave us the power to.